Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is from chapter 292. Chapter 292. Kutusov, like all old people, did not sleep much at night. He often fell asleep unexpectedly in the daytime, but at night, lying on his bed without undressing, he generally remained awake thinking. So he lay now on his bed, supporting his large, heavy, scarred head on his plump hand with one eye open, meditating and peering into the darkness. Since Benningsen, who corresponded with the emperor and had more influence than anyone else on the staff, had begun to avoid him, Kutusov was more at ease as to the possibility of himself and his troops being obliged to take part in useless, aggressive movements. The lesson of the Tarotino battle and of the day before it which Kutusov remembered with pain, must, he thought, have had some effect on others, too. They must understand that we can only lose by taking the offensive. Patience and time are my warriors, my champions, thought Kutusov. He knew that an apple should not be plucked while it is green. It will fall of itself when ripe. But if picked unripe, the apple is spoiled, the tree is harmed, and your teeth are set on edge. Like an experienced sportsman, he knew that the beast was wounded, and wounded as only the whole strength of Russia could have wounded it, but whether it was mortally wounded or not was still an undecided question. Now, by the fact of Lauritsen and Bethalimi having been sent, and by the reports of the guerrillas, Kutusov was almost sure that the wound was mortal. But he needed further proofs, and it was necessary to wait. They want to run to see how they have wounded it. Wait, and we shall see. Continual maneuvers, continual advances, thought he. What for? Only to distinguish themselves, as if fighting were fun. They're like children, from whom one can't get any sensible account of what has happened, because they all want to show how well they can fight. But that's not what is needed right now. And what ingenious maneuvers they all propose to me. It seems to them that when they have thought of two or three contingencies... He remembered the general plan sent him from Petersburg. They have foreseen everything, but the contingencies are endless. The undecided question as to whether the wound inflicted at Borodino was mortal or not had hung over Kutusov's head for a whole month. On the one hand, the French had occupied Moscow. On the other, Kutusov felt assured with all his being that this terrible blow into which he and all the Russians had put their whole strength must have been mortal. But in any case, proofs were needed. He had waited a whole month for them, and grew more impatient the longer he waited. Lying on his bed during those sleepless nights, he did just what he reproached those younger generals for doing. He imagined all sorts of possible contingencies, just like the younger men, but with this difference, that he saw thousands of contingencies instead of two or three, and based nothing on them. The longer he thought, the more contingencies presented themselves. He imagined all sorts of movements of the Napoleonic army, as a whole or in sections, against Petersburg, or against him, or to outflank him. He thought, too, of the possibility, which he feared most of all, that Napoleon might find him with his own weapon and remain in Moscow, awaiting him. Kutusov even imagined that Napoleon's army might turn back through Medin and Yukonov, But the one thing he could not foresee was what happened. 
the insane, convulsive stampede of Napoleon's army during its first 11 days after leaving Moscow. A stampede which made possible what Kutuzov had not yet dared to think of, the complete extermination of the French. Dorokov's report about Broussier's division, the guerrillas' report of distress in Napoleon's army, rumors of preparations for leaving Moscow, all confirmed the supposition that the French army was beaten and preparing for flight. But these were only suppositions, which seemed important to the younger men, but not to Kutuzov. With his sixty years' experience, he knew what value to attach to rumors, knew how apt people who desire anything are to group news so that it appears to confirm what they desire, and he knew how readily in such cases they omit all that makes for the contrary. And the more he desired it, the less he allowed himself to believe it. This question absorbed all his mental powers. All else was to him only life's customary routine. To such customary routine belonged his conversations with the staff, the letters he wrote from Tarutino to Madame de Stal, the reading of novels, the distribution of awards, his correspondence with Petersburg, and so on. But the destruction of the French, which he alone foresaw, was his heart's one desire. On the night of the 11th of October, he lay leaning on his arm and thinking of that. There was a stir in the next room, and he heard the steps of Toll, Konevitsin, and Bokonitov. Eh, who's there? Come in, come in, what news? The field marshal called out to them. While the footman was lighting a candle, Toll communicated the substance of the news. Who brought it? asked Katusov with a look which, when the candle was lit, struck Toll by its cold severity. There can be no doubt about it, your highness. Call him in. Call him in here. Kutusov sat up with one leg hanging down from the bed, and his big paunch resting upon the other, which was doubled under him. He screwed up his seeing eye to scrutinize the messenger more carefully, as if wishing to read in his face what preoccupied his own mind. "'Tell me, tell me, friend,' said he to Bokinitov in his low-aged voice, as he pulled together the shirt which gaped open on his chest. "'Come nearer, nearer. "'What news have you brought me, huh? "'That Napoleon has left Moscow?' Are you sure, eh? Bokavinatov gave a detailed account of the beginning of all he had been told to report. Speak quicker, quicker, don't torture me, Kutusov interrupted him. Bokavinatov told him everything, and was then silent, awaiting instructions. Tol was beginning to say something, but Kutusov checked him. He tried to say something, but his face suddenly puckered and wrinkled. He waved his arm at Toll and turned to the opposite side of the room, to the corner darkened by the icons that hung there. O oh Lord, my Creator, Thou hast heard our prayer, said he in a tremulous voice with folded hands. Russia is saved. I thank Thee, O oh Lord. And he wept. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 292. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 292 Kutusov's Champions In today's chapter, General Kutusov cannot sleep. Deep into the night, he lies in bed thinking about the campaign against the French. While he's fighting a war against those gallant Gallic warriors, he's also battling his own generals and military staff. Once again, emboldened by the victory at Tarutino, the Russian generals want to take the fight to the French they counsel aggressive offensive action. Kutusov, drawing inspiration from his two champions, time and patience, isn't convinced. Not yet, anyway. He suspects that a mortal blow has been dealt the French way back at the Battle of Borodino, but, like Sherlock Holmes, he knows how dangerous it is always to reason from insufficient data. So he waits. While he waits, his mind runs through countless contingencies. He possesses the wisdom, however, to ignore them, because, as we've seen throughout the novel, he understands that prediction within complex systems is a fool's game. So he waits. Daily Meditation Often reason counsels patience. Seneca on Anger 
All right, that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 292 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you'll find links to my Amazon wish list for books and movies. If you decide to support me by buying me one of those, we'll set up a Zoom call to talk about the book or the movie, or both, or whatever you want to talk about. I look forward to doing that. Your support in any case is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 293 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.